Good day to you all. My name is Dr. Violet Makuku of the Association of African Universities. I'm the quality assurance uh, expert at the association at continental level uh, since 2016. But I'm a former employee of the Bindura University of Science Education and it gives me a lot of pleasure once again although I can't be with you physically, to actually make a contribution to this conference, the 7th African Regional Conference of Vice Chancellors and Deans of Science Education, Engineering and Technology, Codvest 2019 in Victoria Falls, 20th to the 21st of November, 2019. Allow me to stand on the already established protocols. Looking at the theme itself, promoting innovation and the industrialization of Africa through quality STEM education, we are compelled to really delve deep into a quality assurance in STEM. But there's no way we can just rush to quality assurance in STEM without looking at the principles and fundamentals of quality in higher education. So we just want to quickly answer some of these uh, questions because although we are practicing quality, unfortunately one of the major pitfalls is that most of the people who are working in this uh, quality assurance units or directorates in our institutions do not have the training, the skills to really take quality assurance in the institutions to the greater heights which they need to be. As a former quality assurance director, I was just privileged that I had stayed and worked in the university system for more than 10 years and I also have got a PhD qualification in quality assurance in university education. That would be the ideal situation. But in the absence of that, what can we do? What do we need? This is the reason why, as the Association of African Universities, we saw it fit that we could have workshops in quality assurance, in quality in higher education institutions, quality in higher education teaching skills, quality in research and community engagement. What is quality in higher and tertiary education? The issue is we have a narrow perspective and narrow understanding of quality in higher education. Quality would mean something like fitness for purpose. And I think this is what most people know. We also have quality as meeting set standards. We know people also know this one because programs need to be accredited. But for them to be accredited, they have to meet the minimum standards either for the Council for Higher Education, a national accreditation body, or something like the Zimbabwe Council for Higher Education. But the problem there too is that for many people to understand the real process and procedure of how to undergo the meeting of set standards. Only a few people in the institutions are normally involved, which is a problem on its own. Value for money, it's another one. Value addition, it's another one. If at all I've done an undergraduate program in a STEM discipline, when I go to do a master's or a PhD, Will I have some changes which will come that can, I can acknowledge to say this is value for my money? But there are different stakeholders who are also concerned about uh, these uh, values and also each and every one of uh, the definitions of quality in higher education. We also have transformation for the better. Whose transformation? Transformation for students transformation for the whole institution, transformation for all the university community and members of staff, whether academic support or academic staff. And I want to dwell more on this one because it is this transformation which is brought by building the quality culture that we can now have STEM embedded in whatever we do. But we can't have STEM 
in an environment that is not conducive, everything else needs to be checked. Do we have a, a calibrated pieces of equipment so that if students are working, they always get good measures that they can finally come out with the good results. Transformation is an important and very, very important aspect of STEM. We have uh, the brand. If you are an institution, in terms of the staff service, in terms of the quality of staff, their competency in everything that they do, it really counts. And then it gives your institution a brand. When your students graduate, are they the ones who are said, if it is a job, let's have those applications from those students. I'm not sure. Are you the ones who have got graduates whose application letters are thrown into the waste bin because you are not a brand? I will now move on to some key aspects of uh, uh, quality, but we need to know first what are the major tenets of quality and quality assurance in higher education. Before we do that, I always want people to take cognizance of the broader perspective under which institutions are operating. This one, we can call it the internal quality assurance, which is at institutional level. Don't worry about pleasing the Council for Higher Education because even when they are coming to accredit your institution or your programs, they will come and go, but you are there to stay. And the quality of the institution, the quality culture is built by you. So for me, internal quality assurance, the quality assurance unity, I can consider it to be an atom in physics or a cell in biology, because this is where everything starts. But we need now to work with our professional bodies. Do we have uh, uh, advisory boards for all our STEM disciplines? We need to, if we don't have at departmental level and faculty levels, then I think that's where we are also missing it. We have national quality standards. These should not be our enemies. We should befriend them. They should be part of our systems so that at any one point, they are not questioning our practice because they know our operations. But we don't operate in a vacuum. We are now talking of the global village, and we have the regional quality standards. We have the international quality standards, which, of course, can also be at regional level and continental level. This is where I come in with uh, the continental level issues, which I'm going to share with you later, time permitting. But now, allow me to get into quality issues, which are really pertaining to STEM disciplines. First of all, we need to have viable programs. And one indication of quality of a program is programs that are relevant, programs that are sought after, programs that solve the SDGs, the 17 SDGs, but now, unfortunately, if I were to ask you just to tell me the SDG which we are saving, some people don't know. I conduct workshops of huge numbers, 60, 100, 200. But you find that sometimes only three to five people know any one of the 17 SDGs, even by number. That's worse. It's a task which is scary. So we deal with SDG 4 on education, and 4A in particular is the quality of higher education. We also need to check now regarding that we have issues of climate, we have issues of uh, 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 food security, we have issues of peace and security. And within all this, you are going to realize that they need us to do quality work. We are all included in all our various system disciplines. So our programs should not be narrow, a narrow channel of STEM disciplines. Let's widen them. But you ask me, how do we widen these disciplines? 
These days, we talk of interdisciplinary research and multidisciplinary research. You know, people are mistaken. In most cases, I've gone to institutions for institutional evaluations. I'm told, Doc, these people are not giving us money because they say we fall in the humanities, we fall in this field, which uh, is not really relevant to addressing current social issues and current scientific issues. Now the day talk is the fourth industrial revolution, fourth industrial revolution. But ladies and gentlemen, we need to take cognizance of what is happening now? Where are we? I said interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. Research is quite important. Not only research, but even the programs. Because when we mix the STEM disciplines with the humanities, we end up having a global resolution and global perspective of the kind of issues and challenges which are not only associated to STEM, so if we isolate STEM from the social sciences and humanities, that's a grave and big mistake that we are facing. Let me tell you just quickly two examples. When HIV came, the epicenter was Uganda. All the medical people, all the pieces of equipment, all the drugs, that was the convergence point. But it continued to escalate only until somebody raised it that we need the social sciences people. How would you deal with the culture and social beliefs which are deep rooted in people? We needed them also to help us to say, how do we penetrate into people to make sure we spread and preach about the disease and also how we could keep it? So the religious people, uh, the social sciences people, the humanities came in and it helped a lot to reduce by 33 until we got to the level of 33%, which had never happened since the outbreak of the disease. The same if we have an, an, a malaria outbreak and an increase in deaths due to malaria. Will you wait to say, this month we are giving the medical doctors to check on resistance, or we are giving the, the pharmacists and the chemists to check on uh, 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 expire of drugs or the chemical combinations of the drugs being offered? No, we don't do that. Let's take a holistic approach. Let the environmentalist be there. Let the medical doctor be there. Let the pharmacist be there. Let everybody be there so that we now start. Let those who deal with the, uh, the distribution of mosquito nets be there so that at least we sit on a round table, we deliberate on the problematic issues, and we see each one taking the task along their specialist area of research. We converge on the round table almost at the same time, everybody with results of whether their particular area is problematic or not. But does it start in the workplace? We need to train our students how to take the multidisciplinary approach still when they are in the institutions. I want to talk about the use of ICTs. Very, very important. These days, we have different softwares for engineering. We have dis uh, different softwares for, for architecture, for construction, for medicine, for whichever STEM discipline you may think of. But our lab technicians and the people who are teaching our students, have we staff developed them on how to use the new softwares and the new applications which are there in the STEM disciplines? No, when it comes to workshops and conferences, it's only the top people, chairpersons, lucky deans, directors, vice chancellors, registrars, they are the ones who go. But how about these people, the lab technicians who are in contact with our students on a day-to-day -day basis? You know the way ICT is moving. It's moving very, very fast. And we also need to quickly change and adapt to that. Very, very important. Now, if there's the adaptation, but we see 
that it's not matching up with the way we are also trying to staff develop the people who are dealing with uh, these things. How do we intend to have, in the end, somebody who is fitness for purpose? It becomes uh, really problematic. So it links up also with the issues of curricula uh, that if at all we also want to move with the times, don't wait to say we are going to have curricular review, send it to Senate and also uh, later on it's approved by Senate. How many times do we have our Senate's meeting annually? Very few times. And during those times, what will have happened? You will realize that there are levels of uh, curricular review which we need to take cognizant of. But we are going to realize that some of us are not aware that at a personal level, at lecturer level, we can also review the curricula. But how? For example, if there are new pieces of equipment, we can come and say to our students, I'm a medical doctor. I know of a new piece of equipment which is there now. So what do we do? We just simply need to say, if the medical school or the teaching hospital does not have, we need to arrange with the hospital which has got the state-of-the-art equipment. Ladies and gentlemen, we are talking about quality in STEM disciplines. This is the way to go, to be highly responsive. So if it is the magnetic resolution that you don't have, then arrange and help the students. Very, very important. We also need to have upgrades on current trends and contemporary issues in higher education. If you stay in your corners as institutions, it's problematic. How are you going to know of the contemporary issues and current issues? You don't even go to the workshops. You don't go to conferences. You don't want to read. I've often given examples of uh, old professors. You know, they tell you, what can you tell me? I've been a professor for 20 years. But you look, there are notes were this white. But now they are this brown. Because for many years, they haven't been changed. So what are they telling students in the lecture rooms? They've been teaching for many years. Apparently, what surprises me is that they are also publishing a lot, but they are not bringing the, publish, uh, the published materials to their students. Apparently, each and every one of us is employed in their specialist area. And then I ask you, why are you not bringing your publications to your students? And share with them, as you are doing your research, make sure you upgrade your notes. And that is very important. And your students will also get something which is fresh. Now students do laugh because they are sometimes ahead of us because of the smartphones and so on. When you stand, you are saying, Richardson 2016, uh, uh, page 56, they already know of a new 2019 or 2018 publication. And they are laughing at you, which means this is not what they need. They need more. In the interest of time, let me look at uh, quickly one other critical area, which is uh, gender. But I think on the use of ICT, I need to revisit a bit before I go to the gender issue. On ICTs, we also have things like micro labs. We can make use of them. We also have YouTube videos, we can make use of them. But what is highly disturbing to me is that even in this day and age, you find that, for example, lecturers, sometimes they lack that quick flexibility and dynamism to take into the lecture rooms to make their teaching effective. So what do they do? Instead of taking their students out to a maize plant, or to uproot the plant and bring it in the lecture room. They are struggling to draw a non-motion thing, a non-living thing with one color, trying to, and disproportionately drawn 
to illustrate that this is the maize crop, this is the, the tassel. And uh, is that quality teaching, ladies and gentlemen, when the real things are there? Take the real plant, talk about the maize plant, the tassel, uh, the what, and they see the color and the real things. But some of these small, small things can improve the quality of our teaching. Now with YouTube, we have uh, real recordings of volcanic activities. With microlabs, we can also have experiments which could in real life be dangerous. But we can do them in microlabs and uh, students just to see how uh, the chemical reactions take place. But how many of us are struggling to make sure that at least as a university, if we don't have Let's try and work with the other institutions or organizations, research institutes which have got, or other institutions which we can collaborate with and have MOUs with. Now, coming to the gender issue, it's a big, big issue and problematic issue. But what I've realized is that when you are not uh, exposed to what is happening in the world and the continent in general, you may not realize that uh, this gender issue is not like calling upon uh, females to come in to do STEM disciplines. Of course, maybe in most of the countries, that is what could be prevailing. But when I went to Nigeria and when I went to Egypt, I got a shock of my life. Most of uh, these STEM disciplines are being headed, the faculties, by females. And we have the prominent researchers who are making breakthroughs being females too. So what does it mean to us? It means that if we are having female role models elsewhere, and we are having problems attracting more females to do uh, these STEM subjects, we need to really take live, and I mean live examples. Go to the internet, Google and check your specialist area. That's very important and it will encourage. If we have less males also, let's try and encourage males to come on. Before we realize it, if we continue to think it's only the females, the females who are behind, we may be mistaken because very soon we may also lose some of the men. But we need also to incorporate the social sciences and the humanities, like I've said, back in the home so that issues of stereotyping are dealt with. Whether you have boy or girl children, start in your home to make sure that you are not labeling them and giving them toys that can, these are female toys, these are male toys. That is highly destructive because already you are setting the ground. And then we also have uh, issues of uh, textbooks and resource materials. This one may not be in our control but we need to liaise with the publishing houses to make sure that even from primary school going up, we are having what? The textbooks also portraying females and males being engineers, being medical doctors, being architects, being all these other things which are male dominated especially. It's very, very important then we need grooming at lower levels. If it is, for example, Bindura University of Science Education, let's make sure that we have tried to bring on board the primary and secondary. Our community engagement should include those ones to go back to try and inculcate uh, the, the values to come so that all the children who are in the primary school, as they go up to secondary and uh, 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 high school, they now take cognizance of also undertaking uh, uh, the science disciplines. There are many issues which I could talk about, but I also want to talk about collaborations rather than uh, conflicts. It's very, very important because when you look at it, 
If you have uh, MOUs which are functional, you are in a comfort zone. It means you can exchange equipment, you can collaborate to buy pieces of equipment. Do you know that even for internet, most institutions are complaining that internet is very expensive, but at national level, universities can also come together and they have one account which they pay for the internet of universities in the whole country to the extent that your government can even come in and chip in with some percentage because now we will be talking of uh, national research and education communities and networks. And so if, for example, Zimbabwe has got a research network, it's a government entity maybe. And so by virtue of them coming on board, you will find government also chipping in. But it has been observed that to have that kind of realizing the effect of economies of scale, we need to come together, have one account which we all pay for. Whether you have more or fewer students, each and every one of you is likely to realize a reduction by 70 to 80 percent of what you normally paid for your internet. And we know that for the STEM disciplines, it's very, very important to have that. I want to also quickly come on to the issue of community engagement. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we have a huge problem. We have a major problem that as I do institutional evaluations and quality assurance workshops, I've learned that most institutions are allocating like between 10 to 20 percent maximum for community engagement. It means we are not understanding the environment in which we are working. Because if I were you, I would look at how can I make sure that as an institution, there is the real touch between the world where the students are coming from and the lecture room and the STEM disciplines which we are doing. What else would bring us more together and give a better understanding which is not more of abstraction to students than them taking what they know from home, bring it to the lecture room. But we should also know that the SDGs we are talking about are coming from the communities. So why are we not working with the communities? For example, we can apply for a grant to say we want to deal with issues of food security, and we zero down to fish production. So what do we do? If it is fish production, and we know there are fish farmers, would we start by having to construct our own fish ponds, and then we go on to buy seed fish in our agriculture? No. We would need to go to those fish farmers who already have the fish, who already have the fish pond, and we are going to pay them small because they are going to be a source of the labor. So how are they going to help us? They will help us in the sense that already they will help us to tend and manage on a day-to-day -day basis with our students. So it's a good collaboration. When they do it with our students, it then means that our students are working with the community. And when we leave the farmers with the knowledge and uh, uh, skills of how to increase fish production, we know that they will also teach fellow uh, fish farmers. And how many birds have we killed with one stone? This is one example of quality in STEM subjects, quality in STEM disciplines. We need to embrace, again, I want to reiterate, the social sciences and humanities. Where would you operate and do your STEM? In an infested area of ISIS, Boko Haram, and all these fights which are going on. It's only the social sciences which can also help us deal with these issues so that we can accommodate. May I beg 
and kindly request an extra five minutes to now give you a few of the things that we need in order to make sure that we are preparing our graduates for the fourth industrial revolution. It's not about only teaching equipment, uh, about equipment uh, in uh, STEM disciplines. No, it's more than that. There's a certain caliber of a student whom we need to develop in order to make sure that they are just highly adaptive. There's a kind of a certain lecturer, a certain worker in the university community whom we should develop. Uh, this is the important part which I just uh, want to leave you with at the end of the day that uh, before I move to my slides, you see I'm just emphasizing that we need to push the quality agenda in all dimensions. I also want to tell you that quality starts with you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's not hurry to accuse others that they are not doing enough. We also need to do our part. But it's unfortunate that when I go to other universities, the university managers are just paying lip service to quality assurance, but they are not giving the actual support that they should be giving to the institutions. For example, if we have a small budget, what are our priorities? Very, very important. For example, if we haven't even started talking about our budget, what are we doing about building the quality culture? Because it's changing the mindset. It's changing the attitude to a positive one. It's also changing the way we normally do things. How do we normally do things? It's a broader area quality assurance. And there are some things which you may think they are indirect and subtle, which really affect quality and quality assurance. But I want to tell you that even leaving the lights on or not repairing a toilet tap which is leaking, a cistern which is releasing water, will impact heavily on your STEM disciplines. Because now, come month end, utility bills for institutions are more expensive but than the individual households. So we also need to check how do we reduce the utility bills, mostly those two, electricity and water so that at least we have money now which we can channel to other things. There are key competencies which we need to give uh, to our students. We should also have those key competencies in order to impart them to the students. We also need to walk the talk. Innovativeness, creativity, these two are very, very important because without them, the STEM disciplines cannot move. We need innovativeness and creativity on how we can come with new degree programs that are interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary so that they are relevant to the society. Soft skills, even respect, we need them in our graduates. Who would want to employ an engineer who is not respectful to the management? Nobody. Because then how will we run the organizations? Very difficult. Communication skills like listening and even writing skills. You realize that these people who are in the STEM disciplines normally boast that they don't need to know much about uh, writing reports and they don't need uh, uh, to be fluent in their English or French or what have you. It's not true. How are you going to communicate your results to people? You need to know how to deal with people and how to effectively communicate. And this can only come through communication skills, where I hope we all have uh, uh, this as a university-wide course. Entrepreneurial mind. If today you still find you are teaching your students that 
when you finish, you will be a good employee. Please. No, 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 no. Let's change the mindset. Let's change the mindset of our students. We also want them to create jobs. We want them to be owners of companies so that it helps everybody else. Just yesterday, I was listening to uh, 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 SABC, and they were saying, we are now at least funding without interest a person who can create at least 10 jobs. This is where we should go. Can the governments alone manage to continue creating jobs for the ever-increasing graduates? No. We should teach them better. ICT skills, I will not dwell on that because I've already talked about it. Negotiation skills, diplomatic skills, teamwork, STEM disciplines, and also education in general still requires us to recognize the importance of teamwork, evaluative skills, examination skills, professional skills like efficiency and accuracy. And when I talk of STEM disciplines, you know how these things are really pertinent and important. This is the reason why we also need to work with our standards association bodies. Quickly, please, I want to talk about the 21st century teacher because this teacher needs to be transformed from the old teacher to the new teacher. The teacher should be a collaborator, a model, walk the talk, the leader, but everyone is a leader. The visionary, very important. What is it that you see will work better for your STEM disciplines, for your students when they become graduates, for them to be a good brand? The learner, we need to unlearn old things, relearn new things and freeze. But when it's time, we need to learn new things and learn fast this time around because the ICT, the fourth industrial revolution, is making the world crazy. Everything is instant and everything is moving too fast. I hope we will cope. We want communicators, it's being repeated, adapters, the risk takers. You know, in most cases, particularly us blacks, we normally beat our children for failing. We give them names for failure. But if a person does not attempt, how are they going to learn? If you want to drive a car, the driver's license will only be given upon a demonstration that you can drive. Let our students drive. We should not just then be sarcastic or mock them in front of the whole class, particularly those who want to try. They are the best students whom we need in STEM disciplines. It's very, very important. Again, let's look at this one. For us, we need communication, collaboration, critical thinking, creativity. You will just go on to check what is there because I'm running out of time. Let's look at this one, ladies and gentlemen. I wouldn't go without sharing this with you. Seven survival skills for the fourth industrial revolution and the 21st century. Curiosity and imagination. I think you know that for most of our discoveries in sciences, they started with curiosity asking questions and imagination, then we start having our models, our prototypes, and we go on to have the aeroplanes which we enjoy today. As the fastest means of transport, is it all? The list is so long. But some people imagined these things. Some people idealized these things for them to become reality. Accessing and analyzing information, I told you, even the Bible said, my people perish because of lack of knowledge. This happens. If you don't know, you will realize that other institutions will move faster, have better graduates than you, and also make sure their institutions are highly rated because of the way they are doing, because they are outgoing. They are checking 
what is contemporary? What are the trends, current trends, effective oral communication, initiative and entrepreneurialism, agility and adaptability. Flexibility is also part of this one. Very, very important. Collaboration across networks and learning by influence. Critical thinking and problem solving. Very, very important. Ladies and gentlemen, it's only that my time is going, but let's look at this one. The huge problem which we are having is the quality of teaching and learning today. You find that at continental level, when we did the research, most of the questions and tasks that are set for our students are at this low level. It's also because people have misinterpreted the Bloom's taxonomy. When we say with the Bloom's taxonomy, we start from lower order to higher order. We don't imply that at university, first year, we give cheap material, and then final year, we are giving difficult things. No. There are four stages of cognitive development. And what we need to take note of is that by university level, everybody has reached the highest level of cognitive development. And they are expected to be able to tackle this. And it's very, very important. So we are not concentrating on remembering and understanding we are also doing application analyzing evaluation and creation even from first year it's very very important but then you find most of the questions that we are asking a uh, define duplicate memorize classify paraphrase explain and we issue more marks for doing nothing some lecturers even punish students for not regurgitating what they taught in the lecture rooms. Instead of them giving more credit to those who have shown more understanding, it's important. We don't know also. That's why we also need training. We need this higher order. Demonstrate, dramatize, discuss, convert, illustrate, solve, defend, judge, select, evaluate, measure. These are the highest order. Construct, design, develop. But how many of us are playing in these regions to make sure our students are competent? I'm talking about quality assurance in quality in higher education, quality assurance in teaching in higher education, quality assurance in community engagement in higher education, and quality assurance in research in higher education. Where are most of the distinctive researches lying today? The merit ones, they are rotting elsewhere somewhere, but we need to take those back to the community. By community, I also talk about university industry linkages, where again we will get internships, they will see our relevance and try and cooperate, collaborate with us to build labs for us, even equip them. I could give the Deben University example. Deben University of Technology is surrounded by Tonga Tulets, and they've managed to forge a good re relationship and partnership because their students always research on sugarcane diseases increase of production, the communities, and the workers, the hospital, and what? And they've got jobs. They get internships. In turn, the Tonga Tulets is plowing back in the interest of time. I think I will stop here. But ladies and gentlemen, what I want to tell you is that we have workshops which go four days on quality assurance alone, four to five days on quality assurance in research, four to five days on higher education learner-centered teaching skills. You know most of our, uh, of our lecturers are not professionally qualified to teach in the universities. They don't have the teacher education background. And so we help you so that they can do it. We have continental initiatives, and for these ones, because of time, I will just uh, send some soft copy documents which can be distributed to everybody who has attended uh, this uh, conference and many more 
who remain. We should continue to disseminate what we got. I hope also this video will be shared with the participants so that they can also go and talk about some of the things that I could talk about within the given time. I just want to thank you for the opportunity you have given me to talk about quality assurance. I'm passionate about it. It's my area. I eat it. I sleep it. I walk it. And that's all I'm here for as the Continental Quality Assurance Expert. Again, my name is Dr. Violet Makuku. It has been a pleasure to be with you. I'm the Quality Assurance Expert at the Association of African Universities. And I hope to get from you. I think my contact details are there. You have seen them when I initially started presenting. I wish you the best throughout the conference. 